All right, well, let's go through this, see what we can learn, and and then if we're still struggling, then we'll, we can make up some other practice questions and, and run through them as well. So this is, uh, this was exam number two. So same as yesterday, I'll just read the questions, and then you guys let me know what you did, and we'll dig in on the ones you have questions on. Number one, when insulating an unheated crawl space, with a dirt floor, you should also include what in the scope of work? A. 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 Yeah, so it is A. You would install a vapor barrier. Uh, number two, a 12 by 12 room has a vaulted ceiling with a slope of 8 over 12 or an 8 inch. What are the approximate dimensions of the vaulted ceiling? B. I put B. I put D. This, this is the question, the an answers you get to pick from actually kind of help you <laughs> yeah. get, I think, the right answer because they're two of them are the same. Yeah. At least on mine. And then, yes. so. I can figure the, the, how to do the math for it. I just was thinking in my head the pitch is going to be longer. Right. Yeah. So, right. Yeah. This is not a great question. Because it could be a couple different things, right? If this is a vaulted ceiling, what are you guys imagining? Probably just a level and it vaults up or something. We're imagining a vault, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's this is not a this is not a shed vault in our minds. This is a vault vault. Yeah. Right. The answer is uh, twelve by fourteen. I like that. Without really getting too far off the rails, you guys just thought well. It can't be 12, 12. It has to be different than that. It can't be a 12 by 7 because that would be smaller. smaller. Yeah. So in my mind, without doing any other math and, and belaboring this one, the 12, 14, I would have gone quickly there. I think we'll get a, another question or two where we can do some math on it. But uh, Number three, when performing an energy audit on a home with an attached garage, which test should you use to determine the condition of the pressure boundary between the garage and the condition space? Yes, zonal pressure diagnostics. Number four, while performing an energy audit on a home, you discover hazardous materials that could potentially become airborne during your blower door test. What action should you take? C, postpone the test until after the issues have been properly addressed. Yeah. I don't have any great examples of that. I think asbestos usually comes to mind, but we don't necessarily postpone the test, but we'll change the way we're pressurized instead of depressurized. But if you ever ran into something like that, I guess ashes in a fireplace are a good one. Yeah. Where I'll, we'll, we'll postpone that test until the fire dies down. So, you know, we'll choke the fire down right when we get there. Yeah, we'll actually take some of that tape that we could use to cover up bed stuff and mm -hmm. uh, put cardboard over the opening of the oh, yeah. fireplace just to keep it keep cash and come out. That's what most people do. Yeah, it's a great way to deal with it. Uh, number five, what's the most common cause of ice dams on homes located in a predominantly heating climate? I said a, C. A, B, and C. Okay, so A says poorly maintained roof tiles. B, water leaking into the attic. C, air infiltration from the conditioned space into the attic. And D, improperly adjusted combustion appliances. Okay, so C right now. the correct answer is C. Uh, and this was one, it took me a little while to wrap my head around this because I had, I thought ice dams were something else. I thought ice dams, you know how I showed you that spot on the roof out there where like snow could actually yeah. get behind there? I thought that was a, an example of an ice dam, and that is not. What an ice dam is, is, so if you have a, uh, let me make this a little bigger so I can draw the picture better, but we've got our attic here, right? And we get some snow out on our roof. And what happens is inside of our attic, we've got our insulation going on. 
But let's say that they installed, somebody came along at one point and they installed a new bat fan. They didn't bother to insulate over the top of that. And they also didn't bother to air seal it. So every time the furnace kicks on, we have air leaking in here. And that heat rises and it melts our snow. And the snow melts, turns into water, and and it gets about down to here, and it's nice and cold outside, so it, it melts, turns into water, and starts building a chunk of ice right there on the roof. And then we have this little microcosm of a freeze-thaw cycle going on all the time, and basically you get this chunk of ice building up on the roof, and it builds up to the point where it comes back, and it, if there is a, like, let's say there's a plumbing vent, or maybe maybe we actually use this, this is where we put our, our roof termination for our fan, but because we didn't put it, make it airtight and things like that, um, we've got all this heat coming up there with it. Now this ice dam actually builds up to the point where when the water is freezing, it can't run down the hill because it's got this big chunk of ice in the way, and it starts to drip back into the space. It starts to do damage to the, so, you can look and you can see ice damming, you'll, you'll start to see shingles curling and things like that in, in like unique spots or like, like a, not unique, but like a, you know, just a small spot on the roof instead of what you would expect to see across the whole roof under northern, normal weathering. Um, but also you'll see where trusses and stuff will start to get wet. Um, the other thing you'll see, this same thing causes, if it's not causing ice damming out on the roof, you'll get up in the attic and you'll see that there's like this white mold all over the roof trusses and the roof decking up here. And what is that? That is the moist air that came up into the attic and it condensed right there. And so that is not usually an indication of a, a roof leak. It's an indication of, of a bulk moisture leak from down here. We had a home that had an unvented heater. A lot of moisture in the home, and it was actually going up in the you know, mm -hmm. drafting up into the attic, and it had ice damming like crazy. Yeah, you know, because I unvented put more moisture in your home anyway too. You know, so. yeah. I, anyway, it took me a long time to wrap my head around. I still have a lot to learn. Like there's, there's a lot more variables in here um, that I could educate myself on. But in general, that's kind of what's going on. So. That's why the answer to this is that C, air infiltration from the conditioned space into the attic is, is what's causing that ice and that, that air is coming up. And then if you'll take a look around this winter as things start to, as we actually do get some snow, I, I love, I always, when every time I pull into my neighborhood, I'll look at my roof compared to my neighbor's roofs and I can see how effective my insulation is. But you'll always see those, there, there'll be those spots, those little hot spots on people's roofs where there's like just this little circle where the snow has melted for some reason. And if you start looking at that, oftentimes there's a termination nearby or something, but half the time it's just, it just happens to be right below something like that. And it's just melting, freeze thaw cycle is just getting exacerbated in that one little spot. And so, you know, it can cause some problems or kind of speed up some problems that are already there so number six exterior doors most commonly leak air from where just on this one put d more the more travel path yeah so a is hinges b is lock set and strike plate c is the stop jam and d is the threshold I, my educated guess would have gone with d as well I think we see more, I feel like those doors fit this threshold in the suites a little more often than, and, and leave a bigger gap. But So the answer on that one is D. That's kind of the reason why they make those things that you can stick at the bottom of your door, either on, on either side if yeah. you have it shut. And yeah. Because that's where you get a lot of air that just comes in. Oh, yeah. And the shoe's either messed up or not there. And then the threshold is probably usable, but it's not, you got a gap or whatever, and that's where you're most likely going to have a gap. Yeah. 
Yeah, I feel like, and even when you do have the gaps around the sides and the top, those tend to be smaller, like a smaller surface area or whatever. But number seven, while conducting an energy audit on a single story home in with an unconditioned attic located in a predominantly heating climate, which areas should you check for attic bypass and infiltration? C. And I said A. So A. A. And then you say C. C. I was just wondering. I can't remember if we put these lights in the center switch or not. I think they're just off. Yeah. I think we just took the bulbs out, so I can't make any more light up here. Uh, the answer is A. Let's see. This is number seven, right? Yeah. 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 Answer is A. Penetrations in the attic floor. Uh, collar beam joist, chimney penetration to the attic roof, gable mounts window. So, um, see the chimney penetration in the attic roof. I, the reason why that would not be correct would be just that where is your pressure boundary? So you're thinking. So you're saying that, that I, okay, the roof's up here, yeah. and I was thinking down. Okay, I'm with you. Yeah, and that's. The key and word I was there. Of a bypass, like a balloon framing, you know, chimney chase, but I wasn't thinking the key word roof. Yeah. Well, just, and the, the other key there is that it's saying this is an unconditioned attic. Yep. So if this is an unconditioned attic, then we know our pressure boundary should be down yep. here. So that, anyway, that for me, that the chimney penetration in the attic roof, that wouldn't really matter. Matter, yeah. So. Number eight, when doing work on a home, which rules, regulations, and codes have priority in any given location? I got e. mixed up on this one. I put A. I put A. Put B. But it, I was thinking it might have been A. So the answer is B. And this, this applies, it applies with the code and it applies in general. Like when you read the code book, it actually says it. If there are conflicts between any of these codes or, or multiple rules that apply, you apply the most restrictive. Um, but same thing, like if there are federal regulations and state regulations and city regulations and you're trying to meet all of them, if you'll apply the most restrictive, then you'll be meeting all of them. It's kind of the idea behind that. So the most restrictive applicable regulation or code would apply. Number nine. If a measure to add insulation to a home costs $2,300 and the annual energy savings is $280, what is the simple rate of return? I put B. I put C, but no. Yeah. I I can figure out how to do it. I'm not sure how to do it. Okay. So, simple rate of return, the formula for that is actually just to divide the cost by the savings. And so all you do is divide the $280 by the savings of $2,300. What do you get? C. You get 12%. get 12%. should get 12%. Oh, get yeah. 12%. Oh, yeah. Rate, yeah, rate so is I did always expressed as a percent yeah. in those cases. So. It, did I write that right? If you do 280 and then you hit divide and then you do the 2300, then it's giving you the 0 0.12 yeah. or 12%. Yeah, so I did 2300 divided by 280. I always get that backwards. Yeah. And that anytime I do get it backwards, I just always flip it around and double check myself. So, But yeah, so the simple rate of return, we're not talking about SIR or anything like that. There's just the formula for simple rate of return is the cost divided by the savings. So that's probably a new one. We don't really use it much in what we do, but you may see a question about that on the test. So, so if you need to make a note for yourself to write that that's the formula, um, we'll you go back through your notes later. Might want to do that. Uh, number 10, while performing an energy audit on a home, you find a water heater which shows signs of backdrafting. 
In this case, you should use a manometer to perform which diagnostic test? I said B. Yeah, so this again, this is not we're, we would expect to see a worst case draft test here, but right. so it's not it's not on the list. So now we have to think about the terminology. An air volume test, an air leakage test, barometric pressure test, or room pressure differential test. And that's the barometric pressure test isn't it's it's not gonna help us out here. Uh the air leak test, I'm not sh other than using your manometer on your blower door to do the air leak test, but there's really not a direct correlation to the backdraft you can water heater. You can't single that room out. Yeah, and so the, the one that makes the most sense would be testing the differences in the room pressures to see if that one's more negative or something like that, which is really what we're doing when we are doing worst case draft tests. So D is the correct answer. While performing an energy audit, you conduct refrigerator testing and find that your watt meter indicates 0.93 kilowatt hours has been consumed over a four hour period. What is the predicted annual consumption for this appliance? C. C. So the answer is C, but let's do the math. So, Kurt, how would you start this one? How would you? What would you be thinking about on this? Well, for me, I, so I can figure out how to turn the four hours into the day. I just can, you know, for a reference for. I got gotcha. you. Does that make sense? Yep. So, uh, how many four hour chunks of time are there in one day? Six, six, four, eight, twelve. Yeah. So, you would take the six and you multiply your kilowatts by six, right? Because yep. if you if you used in, in one four hour period 0.93, that my person is good. Um, 0.93 kWh. And this is what we are we want to convert our refrigerator consumption into kWh. So we're not going to have to multiply anything by a thousand or divide or anything. We're really just saying we just need to figure out if we use 0.93 in four hours, then how much do we use in one day? And so since there are six four hour blocks in 24 hour period, we would just multiply that by six, right? And so in one day, how much, how many kilowatt hours would that fridge use? 5.58. Five? Five? 0.58 kWh over day. And now, what do we do to convert that to a year? Times by 365. And what do you get? 2036.7 round up to 2037. So 2036.7. So. You will see, uh, well, I can't guarantee it. It's very, very likely that you will see a test like, or a question like that on your test. So let's say it was three hours. Okay. So we had 0.93. In a three hour block. So how many three, three hour, hour blocks, blocks are there in a day? So you're really just dividing 24 eight. by three, right? Yeah. Yep. Yep. So eight. Okay. And, then, and then you would take and multiply that by eight. eight. Okay, I got that 100%. Okay. And then multiply that by 24. So. I understand that. Great, no. Cool. I don't know why, but it seems easier for me to just knock it down to one hour. And then that's that's where my mind goes to. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, if you put it on paper, it actually takes more work, but that's the way my, my brain goes, oh, divide. if it was four hours, I'm going to divide that by four, and then I'll multiply it by 24 and multiply it by 365. Yeah, for some reason that just makes more sense. Yeah. But you'll get there either way if, if you if you want to. Yeah. Um, number twelve. Which or oh, sorry, what is the recommended minimum account amount of time? Goodness. What's the recommended minimum amount of time to run a refrigerator watt usage test in order to achieve reliable data for evaluation? 
put eight. I put eight because I thought it was three, three hours. hours, so that was the closest one. I think three is the minimum, but yeah. this is the recommended. Yeah, so, <laughs> so, yeah, based on this question, I would have expected to see three in the list. Since I didn't see three in the list, then it would make sense that you would step up to the four hours, not down to the two hours. So A is the correct answer there. And that's, we've, you may see some conflicting stuff from time to time. We, that actually is why we decided a few years ago to, wherever possible, we've aligned our policies with the BPI standard so that we have, we can minimize the conflicts. Uh, but anyway, you, you may still see some stuff, so I like that you just use some good logic to get to the right answer there. Number 13, while conducting a watt usage test on an appliance, which situation could potentially introduce a significant error to your final calculation? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, and really, I don't have any suggestions on how to get around that, but A is correct. The, the fridge could enter a defrost cycle during the test period. Uh, I have noticed, I guess the one piece of advice is if you ever, you get your fridge meter and it's like way higher than you thought it should be, you're welcome to retest it. Uh, especially right now where there's fridge shortages and things like that, um, you may want to take the time to retest it. But if you're, if you're testing a fridge, it's looking brand new. But what that requires though is that you have to start paying attention to roughly what you would expect that meter to get, or you've got to do some math in the field before you leave the house to say, hey, was, you know, was this thing, did it give me the right number? The other thing to be aware of is uh, I have had a couple of guys have told me they've gotten really weird numbers on fridge meters and they ended up going back and testing them on a few other things and they found that the fridge meters had gone bad. There's really no way to calibrate them. It was time to throw the fridge meters away. So if you start getting weird readings, be aware it could be a defrost cycle, but it also could be that the equipment's old and needs to be thrown away. But number 14, while performing an energy audit, you meter the existing refrigerator for two hours and record the usage at 0.33 kilowatt hours. The refrigerator you're proposing to replace it with costs $700 and is rated at 515 kilowatt hours per year. If electricity costs 12 cents per kilowatt hour, how long is the payback period for the new appliance? B. Let's see, because B was like, I don't know, I think it was like a dollar less. Eric, yeah. did you, how'd you do on this one? Yeah, I didn't answer it. Okay. This is one I would skip. And come back to. Yep. If you don't have enough time, I would I, guess. I, yep. But let's see if we can figure it out. So let's break it down as much as we can. We're basically we have an old fridge and a new fridge. We want to know if we replace it, how long the payback would be, right? Yep. So first off, we want let's talk about the old fridge. The old fridge, we made we metered it for two hours and we recorded 0.33 kilowatt hours, right? So point. Three, three, AWH for two hours. Yep. And then it also gave us the annual usage of the other fridge. So are we going to need to convert one of these into something so we can compare apples to apples? Yeah. What do we, which one and, and what do we want to do with it? The uh, 0.33. Make that like per year, like an annual cost or annual usage. I mean. Yeah, since the other one is kilowatt hours per year, and if we can convert this one so that we know how many kilowatt hours per year, then we'll be able to start to compare it to that one, right? So, Kurt, tell me what I need to do to convert this one. So, I can the, the two hours. There's 12, where did I have make sure? 12, two hours in a 24 hour period. So I, 
times 0.33 times 12, which is 1445.4. Did I miss Nine. a step? Oh, yeah. sorry. I I <laughs> or or, or did, did you like skip a step? Yeah. 0.33 times 12 was 3.96. And then you multiply that by 365. Yeah, and then you I times it. that by 365. 1445.4. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So now we need to know how long it will take to have a payback. How would we go about that? to to know how much of a benefit you're getting because you know that one so I just took the difference and times that by how much it costs to run per kilowatt mm -hmm. to get that dollar amount uh, of savings difference okay and and then that told you how much the savings would be for what period of time for one year okay so we're gonna since this is how many kilowatts we're going to use in one year, and this is how many kilowatt hours we're going to use in one year, then if we subtract one from the other, then it should, and then multiply by the cost of the electricity, right? Yeah. Then it should tell us how much we'll save in one year, right? So we just take the four, 1445.4 minus 515, and what do we get? 930. Nine. 30 K is K W H per year. And that is how much we will save, right? That's the difference. That's the difference. Yeah. And so let's convert that into money. How much money is this going to cost us? How do we do that? 12 cents per so times like 112. So and it's 12 cents per kilowatt. Kilowatt hour, right? KWH, so we can just simply multiply 930 by 0 0.12, and that gives us what? 111.6. Uh, 111 and 60 cents, right? Yeah. How are we doing, Kurt? Good so far. Following along so far? Yeah, I'm just trying to write it down, sorry. No, that's, that's good. So we now converted our kilowatt hours by, we've multiplied that by kilowatt hours, so we're down to just 1160 per year, right? And now we need to know how many years will it take for that appliance to pay back? How much did this appliance cost us? 700 bucks. 700 bucks. <clears throat> So if we're going to save 11160 per year, how do we figure out how many years it takes to save $700? Just divide 700 divide. by 101. 700 divided by 111. What do you get? 6.27. 6.27, which is B, 6.27 years. So this, I've had a couple of clients where I've been able to explain this to them about why they don't get windows or why they're not getting something or why we're installing these three windows and not those three windows. Most of the time I have to keep it way simpler than that, but I've, you know, there's been a handful of people where there was one guy up in Logan and he sold and installed insulation his whole life. So as soon as we start talking about R values and paybacks, that made perfect sense to them. There was a guy down in Price, and uh, he had taught college courses in physical science and stuff like that. So it was easy to explain that kind of stuff to him. But really where I end up using this more is on my own personal life. If I'm thinking about swapping out this water heater for that water heater, I'm doing this math in my head to figure out, is this worth, is the juice worth the squeeze on I'm such a nerd, I did this math on my Christmas lights. <laughs> and I found that it was going to take 2.8 years before I, you know, switching from incandescence to LEDs before I would uh, break even. 
And since I like the incandescents better, I decided that I was just going to keep burning that electricity. So, anyway, did it help to break that stuff down? Like, honestly, for, for me, that's the very best thing I can do. Just try to take a step back and ask yourself, okay, what is it I'm trying to find? You know, and hopefully that will help you to see how to break stuff into smaller chunks to get to the answer. And then when you've got it, go back and check. Go reread the question. Say, okay, did I did I find the answer? Which if the question was if electricity costs twelve cents per kilowatt hour, how long is the payback period for the new appliance? And so you can be very confident that yes, two point six seven years. That makes perfect sense. That, that you know, with the math we did, and that does answer our question. So number fifteen, if the relative humidity RH in a room is measured at 50% and the ambient temperature in the room is measured at 65%, what will happen when the room is heated to 75 degrees? I put E because I'm not sure. I didn't know what relative Because relative humidity is this completely foreign term, right? Yes. So the colder it gets, the more humidity you have, like the more relative humidity you have. I honestly couldn't even begin to talk about this. Uh, I'll, okay. So Wadro taught me about this, and with it, there's a chart, which I can't even remember the name of the chart, but we'll, I'll find the chart, and we'll talk a little bit about it. But basically, if you look at the chart, it'll show you, and it'll probably back up exactly what you just said. But the chart shows what happens when the temperatures change and things like that, so you can look at the chart. You may have that chart in your, uh, if there are going to be any relative humidity questions on the test, they, I think they do put that chart in your references. So I'm glad the question came up because we need to pull that out and let you guys at least uh, find one or two things on the chart. So remind me to do that. But the answer was C, the relative humidity will decrease. So if you got there, and, uh, I can understand why. I just didn't know if relative humidity was just real. It, it, I really didn't know if it, if it changed from the outside to the inside with the temperature. It was just a, it didn't, you know, whether it changed or not, you know. Yeah, I'm, I don't even dare speak to this one because I, yeah. I just have <laughs> not educated myself on it. So, while performing an energy audit on a home, you notice that the combustion port on the gas fired water heater is discolored. What combustion, or sorry, what conclusion can you make with this information? D. 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 Yeah, so the combustion port is discolored. D, flame rollout has occurred at some point in time. I think that at some point in time is very important. As you guys are auditing stuff, if you ever see that there's an indication of flame rollout, that does not necessarily mean that you automatically just swap that appliance out because that could have been flame rollout that happened and then an HVAC tech came in and fixed that. So watch that one on you know in the real world. Make sure that there is actually a problem with some of these furnaces even though you see some of those signs. Usually and then also a worst case can kind of verify whether or not that is a continuing problem. Yeah I sometimes it could. It could. Um, if you put the CAS under worst case and, and fired, the, and this is usually going to be the furnace, the water heater will do the same thing. You get flame rot on the water heater. Um, but I, there's, it's less likely that if you saw flame rolled out on the water heater, it's less likely that a tech came in and fixed that. Because it seems like in the industry, it's more like, well, the water heater's got flame roll out, we'll swap it out. We have one guy in our program that actually could fix that problem on a water heater. And it's, that's kind of the case in the HVAC industry as well. Um, on the furnace, on the other hand, though, it's there's a lot more knowledge base, a lot more training there where people have uh, learned how to fix flame rollout issues. And so anyway, but it's a great indication. Watch for that, but don't don't uh, take it for fact. So, hey Dalton, what do you know about relative humidity? Oh, wow. <laughs> so, so I told I'm not going there. Do you remember the, what's that chart called? Do you remember? The psychrometric, the yeah, psychrometric chart. The psychrometric chart. Do we have a 
copy of that anywhere? If, if, just if you get a minute in the next little bit. Okay, I'm actually going to, I got to head into Ogden to go grab our food. Oh, yeah, that's more yeah. important than finding Sacramento. <laughs> yeah. okay, we don't care about relative humidity. <laughs> yeah, we can find one during lunch or something. I just wanted to show them what, what it would look like and talk about it. But I've already told them I don't know anything, so. Yeah, I thought we could pull one up. Yeah. They have that on the internet now. All right, what number were we on? 17. Okay. So while preparing a CAS worst case draft test on a home, you note the temperature of the gas fired water heater flue is at 103 degrees Fahrenheit, and the ambient temperature in the CAS is 68 degrees. What should you do next? The correct answer is B, but this is an outdated question. Uh, the BPI 1100 standard, this applied to, if I'm not mistaken, it was in the 1100 standard. The 1200 standard, they basically made the worst case draft test where if it's a hot or a warm vent, then you do the two or five minutes depending on the appliance, and if it's cold, That's then why you I do it. Keys, yeah. Says yeah. You shouldn't see a question like this. This one is an outdated question. But what it was is that they, the guidance used to be that you wait until the flu comes back to room temperature and then you retest. But then they they came up with a method to test it as a hot flu. So you don't have to deal with that anymore. But the answer to this question used to be B. Wait until the flu is at room temperature. Number 18, while performing an energy audit on a home, with a standalone natural draft water heater, you record a CAS depressurization reading of negative four Pascal. According to BPI, um, according to BPI standards, what should you note in your file? C. C, the water heater passes the CAS depressurization test. I put A, but it failed, but C is right. Yeah, so when you perform an energy audit on the home, standalone natural draft water heater, you record the CAS depressurization reading at negative four. So it's pretty much saying the rooms is also an outdated question. <laughs> at a negative. Yeah, so back in the day, we actually had CAS depressurization limits. You guys heard that before at all? The CAS depressurization limit used to be it. you couldn't go any more negative than negative five. Oh, really? So the answer to this would be that it passes. But huh. but again, what what BPI conceded was that you know what? It really doesn't matter how negative the CAS is. If the appliance is drafting, the appliance is drafting. Yeah. And so they've stepped away from the CAS depressurization limit. Uh, if we got a negative four on the vent pressure, what would that mean? And that means you venting properly. Yeah, you want on the old one. Oh. Oh. On the new on if, if it was on the vent pressure, not the CAS, not the pressure oh, yeah, of the CAS, but the, if it was the pressure in the, the vent, vent, if we measured a negative four pascal, yeah, yeah, that's true. then we know that it's venting, right? Right. Yeah. But yeah, you shouldn't see that question, but you could see something like a, it, it might ask you about the vent pressure. Um, if you do see any CAS worst case tests, read it carefully and think about because there's really two parts to that test. Like the first part is you depressurize the CAS and you measure how how much you were able to yeah, depressurize the CAS. And then part two is then you start measuring the vent pressure. We end up doing that on the left and the right hand sides of the of the gauge. And I feel like for a lot of people those two numbers get jumbled up. Yeah. So just make sure that you're reading very carefully and going, okay, are we talking about CAS pressure? Because that's the pressure in the room, or are we talking about vent pressure, which would be how much pressure is in our stack or our vent or our chimney or whatever you want to call it. Number 19, when conducting combustion analysis on a furnace equipped with a draft hood, where should you take your sample? C. 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 C, before any dilution air is introduced. Why? Yeah, how will it screw up the test? Yeah. 
air free. Um, it's it's literally diluting the yeah. air. Yeah. 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 Like that dilution air is getting mixed in, so you want to get down there before the dilution air is mixed in, so you can say how many parts per million in what, just the combustion gases yeah. before they get mixed in with diluted air. So yeah, C. 20, while performing draft testing on atmospherically vented appliance, where should you drill a test hole? D. I got confused on this one. I put A. Oh, yeah. It is D as in dog, and that is, all it's saying is that it, upstream, downstream, whatever you want, it's that you, you actually, you don't want to drill your hole too close to the dilution air. You actually need to get up into the vent at least 18 inches. That's, that's kind of the standard. Yeah. So where this is one to two feet downstream of the draft diverter. So that would, that would mean you're drilling your hole up here somewhere. Yeah. If you ever, I, I've had a few situations where I, you know, either don't have the equipment or I can't drill the hole or whatever. And if you have a longer probe, like a metal probe, if it's long enough to reach, you can you can actually push it to where it's up there a foot, foot and a half. And it's, it does the same thing as drilling a hole, but we prefer to see those holes drilled as long as it's the single wall. Don't, you, if you get into the double wall, you shouldn't be drilling holes in double wall because you'll, your drill will go through and it'll crush that interior wall and cause problems. Uh, 21, while performing a CAS worst case draft test on a natural gas water heater, you note that after three minutes of operation, spillage is occurring only at the backside of the draft diverter. What should you note in your paperwork? A. A. Okay, the answer here is A. It is. If it's spilling, it's spilling. I don't really care where it's spilling from. Um, the wait five minutes and before testing spillage on this appliance. It, if you were wanting to retest it, I you know. It, but again, that one actually kind of falls under the old standard as well, so it wouldn't be correct on this test at all. And then, yeah, the other two are. So yeah, but this one really falls a little more in line with the way we're the, the current standard, and that's if it's if there's any spillage, it fails. So whether it's coming out of the back or in or the side or anywhere else. Twenty-two. If the relative humidity in a room is measured at fifty percent, the ambient temperature is measured at seventy percent. What temperature will the air in the room reach dew point? This one is also one where we need the psychrometric chart to figure it out. So we'll come back to that one. Did you guys, uh, any guesses? Steve? I did C. I did A based on the answers you got to pick from. Yeah. Because lower temperature, so I think everyone's confusing relative humidity and dew point now. Mm -hmm. So your dew point. If I'm remembering the BPI uh, building principles book, yeah. I know it talked a lot about that. I think it's lower temperature is not going to hit your dew point. So it wouldn't be the lower temperatures. Uh, and I think it's when it rises is when it can reach the dew point. Let me see if I can find a psychometric chart real quick. The answer was B, so you guys don't trust your guts at all. <laughs> okay. At least when it comes to relative humidity. I thought it was like 12 degrees or something. Okay. Oh, that's what it is. When uh, relative humidity and temperature are the same as dew point. Maybe that I'm remembering it wrong, so I think that's what it 
the rule is or some track. Uh, I was hoping to find this one's not coming up with the Wade had a really good chart. This one is explaining the principle behind it, but it doesn't actually help us find the answer. I think if it's a fifty percent. We'll have to degrees. we'll have to find you a good chart. But but yeah, it's what I took from it is that the dew point changes based on relative humidity. Yeah. And so like air is not always going to condense at the same temperature. It depends on how much moisture is in the air and and stuff like that. So anyway, so I just I you know, just the little piece of information for me was the dew point's always going to move and change. And really for us where dew point comes into play is um, there, there is some stuff where you can use it in the HVAC world and, and things like that. But I feel like we don't really have to get into that too deeply. Uh, where it's been most meaningful for me is when I think about a wall assembly or an attic assembly. And if the, if the moisture is going to condense somewhere, I want to make sure that I've got a good vapor barrier so that it's not making its way into that wall. It's helped me to understand how a wall could become filled with mold. And it's that you can literally have, you can have moisture actually slowly permeate the drywall and then get halfway through the wall. And because it's really warm in here and really cold out there all the time, you can halfway into the insulation. That's where that moisture actually condensed and then started to mold. That's not, you know, the question is really just saying, you know, do you understand the, how to use it and stuff like that. So we'll, I'll see if we can find something during lunch because it might be good. This, I found a handout here that might help us a little bit, but let's see if we can find a better one. But yeah, answer is B, and I can't tell you why yet, but we'll see if we can get self smart. 23, while conducting a blow order test on a home, you note the wind is causing erratic readings. What could you do to dampen the effects the wind is having? Yeah, B, you could change the time average function. What else could you do in the real world? Stick your hose in a bottle. A bottle yeah. Stick it in a Coke bottle. I think and now then, they have a, oh, I don't they know. have like the wind effect thing on there. Yeah, yeah I, I keep, I actually keep an empty 20 ounce Coke bottle in my. Does it work bottle. pretty good? It works okay. Uh, it, it'll definitely dampen it, but they also have the DG1000, they just, the tech, well, the Energy Conservatory just released a wind adjustment I know tool. The, uh, and maybe it's just my theory, but I know just especially now it's winter time, when you're doing a worst case draft, when your hoses are really cold, and you put them in the cat room, mm -hmm. it, you're, like when you're getting ready to start, your numbers are bouncing up and down like crazy. Oh, just as the hose is warm the temperature up. of that hose is making a draft. Yeah. That does, and maybe it's, just, oh, it's too tedious, but. Yeah, no, it, it, that makes sense to me. The thing I've noticed is um, anytime we, I feel like sometimes we'll do our worst case draft tests and we'll read our pressures and we've read them really before things have stabilized. Yeah. Um, and I, anyway, that that's the thing that I've noticed where I'll get numbers skewed and stuff. So in addition to doing a time average and, and getting just a better average because of wind, yeah. also keep in mind that if you just close this door, now the pressure change that that caused, it might spike and you could record that. But what you really want to do is you want to let it yeah. uh, settle back down. You want to let things stratify and then and then record that pressure. Yeah. Because that's going to be a more accurate way, I've especially other, when you're doing some worst people case. do the worst case draft and they open it for like two seconds and mm -hmm. you know nothing, then they shut it. And like yeah. wait, you know, a couple minutes or yeah. But yeah, changing the time average. Hopefully, you guys have used that. That that's in that's that comes to mind when you run into those issues because that oftentimes will solve your problem. Twenty four. While conducting a blower test on a home, it is necessary to what? So C is correct, open all interior doors. A, open any doors between house and attached garages. So if we're doing a blower door. Wait, which one are we on, 24? 24. Yeah, okay, yeah, I got it, I got C. Did you get C, okay. okay. Yeah, I would assume we could read through all of them and, and see why 
none of them are correct except for CO. That's the other thing to note when you're taking these tests. Uh, all of the training on how to write multiple choice questions, the, the, it is that you have to write one question, you should write one question that is absolutely correct, and the other questions have to have some aspect of them that makes them incorrect. And so if you don't know what the correct one is, then start narrowing down, you know, or ruling out the ones that you know are incorrect, and then you you might raise your chances, get down to a 50-50 guess or something. But anyway. While conducting a thermal imaging scan from the inside of a home, where the indoor temperature is 72 degrees and the outdoor temperature is 98 degrees, you would expect the wood framing in the wall to appear how? I'll put A on the day. What did you put? D. Okay. The answer is D. If it helps, draw yourself a picture. And I, I find myself doing this half of the time I get my thermal camera out. I have to sit there and, I don't draw it, but I have to sit there and think about this picture in my brain so that I can figure out what I should be seeing. So what this is saying is, we'll pretend that that's inside our house. This says, we're conducting thermal imaging scan from inside the home. So we're standing in here with our camera. And the indoor temperature is 72 degrees. The outdoor temperature is 98 degrees. And then it just says what you would expect the wood framing in the wall to appear what? And it says, would you expect it to be warmer or cooler? Uh, your wall is made up of studs and either empty air or insulation, right? And it does say you would expect, so this may be assuming that this is filled with insulation. If this wall was filled with insulation and it's warmer outside than it is inside, how will that heat be moving through the studs? Heat moves where? From hot to cold. And does this heat move more quickly through wood or uh, R15 fiberglass bat? It's going to go through wood more quickly because, and that's, we, we say wood has an R value of like a, if it's a two by four, we have an R, like R1 per inch. So we're like three and a half R's, right? So if the R value of this is R3.5 and the R value of our, our insulation here is an R15, then we would expect that that outside heat, the 98 degrees temperature, is actually moving through this stud quickly. And R just stands for the, like, is it, yeah, I can't remember the term, the word. Basically, it's, it, it's a measurement of how fast heat moves through that assembly is what we're measuring in the R values or the U values. Um, so, it's going to move more quickly through the studs than it would through these cavities. And therefore, it's going to, you would expect on your IR camera that these studs would show up warmer than the cavities in the middle. If they did show up warmer than the cavities in the middle, then what would that indicate? Say that again. If, if you look at your IR camera and you see that these studs are showing up they are warmer than the spaces in between, then what is that a good indication of? It's insulation. That it is insulated, yeah. Now, what if we flip this around? What if it's, it's still 72 degrees out inside, but I guess it could have just left. Let's say it's eight degrees outside. So it's super cold outside. And you're still in the house and you're looking at your IR camera, then what would you expect to see? The opposite. Yeah, you would expect your studs to look colder. And instead of the heat moving this direction, it's that they're taking that 72 degree temperature and they're actually transmitting that heat right out into the outdoors as fast as an R3 will allow it to. 
And then, and that's why we put the insulation in there is to keep that heat from, you know, moving through that part. But, but yeah, those will show up cold. And so it's, it gets, for me, it gets really confusing in the spring and the fall when I don't really have a, a big Delta T, like I'll get there and if there's five or 10 degrees and I'm looking at the images on my IR camera, I'm like, I can't tell if there's insulation in this wall or not. And it, it, it'll confuse me even more when I am looking at a wall and the sun is shining on that wall and I'll look at the thermal image of that wall, but then I'll go look at another wall where it's not shining on it and I'm getting the same thermal image. And Anyway, it can get kind of confusing, but if you have nice, a really nice big delta T and you don't have too many other factors going on, that IR camera can actually be really handy to let you know. I need to use my more. Yeah. What I'll try to do is I'll find, I'll try to find that wall where it's going to have the greatest delta T. I'll get confident in what I'm seeing. And then I'll take that and I'll go around the rest of the house and say, does everything else look the same as what I figured out over here? And then if there are anomalies, that's when I'll dig in a little deeper. So anyway, there's your IR training. That's all I know about them. I can show you a bunch of a bunch of colorful pictures, but that's the extent of it. Okay, so that was 25. So we're on 26. While performing ambient CO testing in a building, you should do what? Yes, hey, you're going to take your instrument outside, check your outdoor CO levels first in order to establish a baseline. So you're zeroing out your stuff outside. Number 27, which condition in a home can lead to increased radon levels in the home? D. Yeah, D, a basement with negative, with reference to outdoors. It's negative with reference to outdoors. So that's that picture we drew yesterday. 28, according to ASHRAE 622 to 2010 standards, a 32 square foot home with three bedrooms and two occupants requires how much ventilation in order to maintain acceptable indoor air quality? Okay, if they ask you a question like this, then your first indication is going to be that they will be providing you the 2010 standards somewhere in one of the one of their references because this is not something they would expect you to memorize and uh, and if you did see this question it should say the 2016 or something like that it probably would say the 2010 and if you went there it's just going to show you a table and in the table you would actually look up the number of bedrooms and the number of occupants and it would tell you how much ventilation is required the answer was a how was your guy i guessed you guessed right. <laughs> you're, you're right. No? You're, no, you're I guess D. 0 for 2 so far? Yep. All right. Um, let me make myself a... This is not one of the tests. I've, I've gone through a couple of the tests and updated them. But I need to... I got some homework to do here on this one. You guys were my guinea pigs. Isn't that great? 29, while performing energy out on a home, you notice the client has hung wet clothes in the basement to dry. The home is equipped with a clothes dryer and the client insists that it costs less to air dry the clothes than to use the clothes dryer. What should you explain to the client? D, practices that increase moisture in the home can have negative effects on the home. Yeah, that's, that is correct. May not sell them on that, but whatever. 30, which of the following must be present in order for mold to grow? C. 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 Good job. Yeah. C. You need moisture, you need organic material, and you need mold spores. What is VLCs again? I could not remember. Uh, they're volatile something compounds, but volatile. Oh, that's for the furniture? Yeah, that, that can be carpet. Yeah, be, yeah. I can't remember what the O in the VOC stands for. Furniture, like organic, organic compounds. Compounds, yeah. Yeah, that's what it is. It is. I think it's the furniture, carpets, off gassing. Yeah, it's yeah. it's the off gassing stuff that you're getting from. You're getting it from everything. You're getting it from paint. Volatile off gassing. That's uh, organic. Is it organic? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, 
but yeah, so mold, there's billions of mold spores in the air right now. It's all around us. It's always there. So you really just need uh, moisture and, and organic material that it can grow on. So, which of the following must be present in order? Oh, I did that one. 31. Which, while performing an energy out on a home, you insert a probe into a porch ceiling attached to the home and record a reading of zero pascals. What can be concluded in this situation? I put B. I put C yeah, because C. you don't know if you're in the house. Or you don't know well, if that's reference to well, your blower house. Right. Yeah. You need more theory. information. Yeah. The, the, for me, immediately, I'm like, with reference to what? Where am yeah, I standing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So C is you need more information. 32. Which of the following building materials must is most prone to thermal bridging? Yeah, the answer is D, it's metal. Um, and I, I don't know, you, you could get, you could make some arguments there, but I, my mind kind of goes, which of these has the lowest R value? Which of these is going to conduct heat through it the fastest and it's metal? And uh, if you don't believe me, just put your hand on your Dr. Pepper there and see how quickly it goes from nice and deliciously cold to warm. And it's because it'll literally, that aluminum on that can, I don't know why we put our sodas in aluminum cans. Because yeah. the second you take them out of the fridge, they're conducting heat away from them. But maybe it's, we put them in cans so that they'll cool down real quick. Do you know if plastic is better or worse? Uh, it's It has a higher R value. Than metal, like, and that's that's. I don't know if that's completely the reason, but I would assume that was the thinking behind the move to the vinyl window. It could have had a lot to do with the manufacturing process as well, but I, I think that's because this is easily malleable to the size, yeah. and it's a low weight, and so it's easier to. Oh yeah, mass produce. Yeah. I, I just always wondered if somebody thought, you know, this is, my drink would get cold quicker if I put it in the aluminum can, but I don't, I doubt anybody overthought it that much. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I actually watched some weird how how they do it, why they do it thing, yeah. about why the can is the way that it's shaped and everything. It's, somebody engineered the ever-living crap out of these things. Yeah. So, but once I learned that, th this will drive you nuts, so next Next time you're sitting on some aluminum bleachers at a game, pay attention to how quick your butt is getting cold. Yeah. And it's because you're sitting on aluminum bleachers or metal bleachers, and the heat is moving from hot to cold, pulling it. And out. it's literally moving very, very fast now because you're on aluminum. So it's the heat's just getting sucked right out of there. Anyway, fun stuff that we learned about. Um, 33. While performing a blower door test on a house with operable crawl space vents, you should ensure the vents are what? E? I put I'm e. in a mixture between A and B, but I picked I picked B. I really didn't know. I don't like this question. I mean they I just kind of just really I put D and I was like in the real stuff. world, what would you do? You block it off or water it open, test in both ways. Yeah, I don't know. Because well, when you put the house in a wintertime conditions, you're supposed to close all the windows and doors. Yeah. And you're also supposed to close any permanent openings to the outside, aren't you? Yeah. yeah. The answer here says that you want them in the open position, but I disagree. I think you would want them in the closed position. So, I mean, you guys have a copy of our worst case draft form there. What does that say um, on step number one or two when we're setting up for a test? Maybe it's three. Appliances, fireplace, exterior windows and doors. Close all building exterior doors and windows. Leave outdoor openings for combustion air open. So that one it doesn't really address it. It might get in more detail in the actual. How about your quick reference well, chart? If I mean, it doesn't say specifically that, uh, like you your, your PPI, you had your structure. furniture or whatever in the crawl space, you want those open. If you were using it as combustion air, yeah. 
I mean, that's the only thing that you can connect yeah, to in these first couple of steps, anything there. Uh, my, my contention would be close it because, so take our house out here, for example. We have a vent on the crawl, but if, if you were trying to determine where you want to establish the pressure boundary, I would want to close the vent and I want to close the, um, the door and then I'd get a good zonal. This question is asking when you're running a blower door, should you have them open or closed? Um, maybe a better question for this, maybe what they're trying to teach on this one is, uh, what about a, a garage door? When you're running a blower door on a house with an attached garage, yeah. should you run the blower door with with that exterior door open or closed? closed. And it actually should be open. Oh, really? if, you, if you want to really measure how much air is leaking, so if you're you got an attached garage here, right? If you really want to see how leaky this wall is here, then open your garage door. Oh, the garage, not the door. Yeah, not the door between the house. Not the door between the house. Sorry, no. but yeah, the, oh. either that or the man door out here, because because this is acting as a barrier, uh, a secondary air barrier, and you know it has an impact on your bloater. Yeah. So maybe that's what they're after there is that they were trying to say you'd want to open up the openings on your crawl space so they're not acting as a secondary air barrier. But I don't really like the question in general. But hopefully it was worth the discussion there. So I'd give myself a point if I got a D or a B. You shouldn't see a question like this on the test. They've, we do have some of this stuff that's a little outdated and they did a really good job of cleaning that up. A few years ago, we had lots more bad questions like this, but you shouldn't see anything like that. At what point do you need to add a blow ring while doing a blower door test on a home? Okay. Let's see. So the answer is A, when the fan pressure is below 25 Pascal. Um, let me tell you why it's not C. It says whenever you can't reach a negative 50 Pascal. So remember that when you're running your uh, manometer, the manometer, if you've selected that it's you're measuring. Weeks about this. What's that? They called me two weeks yeah. ago. This one like if, if you're measuring, uh, you've, you've selected flow at 50. If, if you can't reach 50, it's mathematically correcting it. Mm -hmm. And it's telling you, even though you're only at 46, this is what your flow would be if it was at 50. And what happens is, mathematically, it can correct it. But the further away from 50 you get, the bigger the margin of error. and Basically, when you get down to 25 Pascal, that the margin error is so great that that's where your manometer is actually going to tell you, hey, install the next ring. So I think we we don't really think too much about it because our manometer just tells us install the next ring, right? Yeah. So we don't give it a lot of thought. But yeah, it's you can you, your blower door is rarely right at 50 unless unless you've got really good stratification and very very little wind and everything else going on. Um, but a lot of times you got flutters and fluctuations going on as the air moves through the house and it's rarely right at 50. But, so it definitely wouldn't be C, but uh, A, you know, if you're guessing, then I would go with A um, based on the other options there. So 35, which of the following data is used in a base load calculation? B is in boy, the cost of energy. Which of the following data is used in a base load calculation? And it's the cost of energy. It's, it does, the number of occupants might throw me off a little bit, but does the heating or cooling degree days have any impact on a base load? No. It won't change how often the occupants are leaving the lights on or off. Um, the reason why it wouldn't be the occupants is you, nobody would ever, I couldn't, ever see anybody arguing to make a case to use the occupants because every occupant is so different that they're just way too much of a variable. It's kind of like what we're talking about with, with the showers. Like, I, I'm really surprised, I, I don't know, 
it, it's it's just such a wild guess where we're going, yeah, there's five occupants and, and we, we're just going to say they probably all shower five minutes a day or ten minutes a day. But, you know, some of our occupants never shower. So it's, there's just too many variables there. But So really, the best answer there is going to be the cost of energy because that is part of the base load calculation. 36, while conducting a duct leakage test on a home where all of the ductwork is located outside of the conditioned space. You note know the return duct leakage is 100 CFM and the supply duct leakage is 250 CFM. What, if any, will the conditioned envelope, what way, if any, will the conditioned envelope be affected when the air handler is operating? D. And D. So what's going on in this situation? We found duct leakage of 150 on one side and 250 on the other side. So we're going to have something that's our our air delivery system is going to be out of balance, right? Yeah. Um, and we need to know if it's it's asking will the condition envelope be affected when the air handler is operating more negatively or positively? So the answer is D is in dog. It will become more negative, but just draw yourself a picture. So we have ductwork that's completely outside the envelope. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. So like in a crawl. And yeah, so in a crawl or in an attic, whichever. So we'll draw some ductwork down here. Here's our furnace. Here's our supply. Here's our return. So air's going this way out this way right and we're measuring our leakage and our leakage is 150 over, here. 150 over here and 250 over here so there's a little bit of leakage here and which way is the leakage going is it pull, pushing air out of the duct or sucking air in on the supply it's going to push it out on the supply, right? Oh, yeah. oh, so this is positive. Is that the sorry, the 150 is the return. 150 is the return? Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry, guys. Here, I'll just, change. I'll just turn my arrows around. I'm going to really confuse this all. Okay, so this is our supply. This is our return. So, yeah, if on the supply side, we have leakage, and it's coming out this way. On the return side, we have leakage, but it's going to go this direction, right? So if there's more leakage here than there is here, this part's sucking air in and making it negative. This part's making it positive. So would it make it more positive or more negative? I think it would make it more positive, right? So that should be the right answer, but it's not. Let's reread the question. While conducting duct leakage tests on a home where all the duct is located outside the condition envelope, you note the return duct leakage is 150, the supply duct leakage is 250. What, if any way, will the which the, area the, the condition area envelope above. be affected when the air handler is operating? So oh. we're not talking about pressure here. Talk about pressure up. Talking about pressure up here. So if if there's more leakage here, then it means there would be less leakage coming or less air coming in here, right? Right. Yeah. And if there's less leakage here, that means this is pulling more. So, so I could see how you yeah. pull more air into this, and and less air would be coming out. It'd be making its way over here and leaking out here instead of coming back in the building. Put this under negative pressure. I think I skipped right over the well, the condition envelope. I was thinking of it kind of like, I didn't think of the air leakage, I was thinking more of the like the static pressure in the duct, but I, you know what I mean? Yeah, I gotcha. Anyway, I think I, I probably would have still got this one wrong, because I would have, I would have stayed down here and not gone back and reread the question. So the answer is D. D, D is in dog, yeah, more negative. Okay, number 37, while performing, an energy audit on a home, you find a master bedroom with two supply registers and no return registers. With the air handler operating, you close the master bedroom door and note that your manometer pressure with 
with your manometer a pressure difference of positive 8 pascals with reference to the hallway. Your work order for this home should include what? Oh, totally let's confusing. see. Yeah, let's see. So the answer is C. It's that you're going to, what does C say? In installation of a transfer grill between the master bedroom and the hallway. So the transfer grills are allowed in our program. But I don't feel like there's, there's like two or three folks that I know of that do a really good job of adding them when it's needed. Um, but it's kind of a mixed bag, depending on the agency and things like that. But you're welcome to add them anytime you run into it. Uh, so as you learn more about when you would add them and why you would need them, feel free to add them to your audits. The only problem is, is you're, there's no way to evaluate for them. So you're always going to be adding them as a non-audited measure. Isn't this probably most common in the mobile home? Uh, I do see a lot of like the pressure imbalances and stuff in mobile homes. And um, or are you thinking about just our transfer drills? Just the trans, like, because that's where I've seen them the most yeah. is in a mobile home. If it's a newer one and they bring certain things up to code a little bit better or whatever, or just they understand. So let's just draw a picture of this really quick and talk about it. So. Let's say that this is our master bedroom here, and it said we have two supplies and no returns. Is that right? Yeah. And then if we have a door over here. When the door is closed, so we, we've closed the door, we're standing out here in the hallway, and we are taking our manometer and sticking it under the door, and we're reading. We want to know, we got a blower door going over here, right? Yeah. So we're depressurizing the house. We want to know if the pressure is the same in this room as it is in this room. And if it's not, then we're gonna, we have some sort of an imbalance. And this is telling us we have a positive 8. So before we suck our hose under the door, what's our manometer going to tell us? The pressure difference between the input and the reference is? Should say zero. Should say zero, right? Now we stick our hose under the door, and now it says 8. It's positive 8. Um, and so what does that mean? If it's positive 8, how could that be positive in this room when this room is negative, negative 0? And what's causing, what is the driving force that's causing that 8 pascals of pressure? The positive air from this supply line. Yeah, it's the air coming out of these heat registers, right? It's pressurizing this room, it's blowing it up like a balloon, and the air... If, it, if this is positive in here, what it means is that the air that's coming out of here, it's going to the path of least resistance, which is going to be out the leaks in the windows and the walls and stuff. But also, by design, it should be to go underneath the door when the door is closed or out the door when the door is open. But if this is positive, it's telling us that uh, not enough air is getting out from underneath the door. And so that's why the answer is that if you could install a transfer grill between the master bedroom and the hall, so we add this extra little grill over here or above that door, now the air can escape out here and give you a better balance in your system. So why would you want to bother with that in weatherization? Like, what do we care if the rooms are out of balance? ceiling purposes like this is why we care right here if you don't do a fantastic job air sealing and this room is under pressure the air is going to follow the path of least resistance if there's not enough room for it to go out there and you did a crappy job sealing that window or you missed a spot uh, you know by some door or something like that the air the conditioned air is just going to go right outside or if you have a hole in the attic or whatever, it's, it's, it's going to go anywhere it can because it's under a positive pressure. And it's always wanting to go from high to low. So it's going to move the way it's designed to move. But, but A, because I didn't know that we could do jumper ducts. Yeah. Yeah, you can. We have the jumper ducts above the doors. 
there's products where you can notch out the bottom of the door and they have this this mm -hmm. grill that sticks on there. The, a lot of the times the easiest fix is that you just pull the door off and you go, as long as, you know, it's a hollow core door, as long as you got enough space there, you can usually trim off three quarters of an inch or something and put the door right back on and, and fix that. But you're welcome to add that to your work orders. I feel like it's something our program, we could really get a lot better at. Um, but then, you know, if you had a better balance system and you got everything balanced out, it's just going to circulate the air throughout the building. And then if you do decent air sealing, you, you're actually going to be saving that client a lot of energy, a lot more than if you would have just left it alone. So anyway, um, 30, 38, 7, 38, 38. While performing an energy audit of a home, you find the domestic hot water temperature at the shower is measured at 153 degrees. What should you do? C. 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 Make a recommendation the water heater temperature should be reduced to 120. Yeah, that is correct. Um, I have my water heater set to heat water right up to 120 and no higher. And even that, it doesn't scald me, but it is uncomfortably hot. So we really, you know, anything higher than that's a waste of energy and could scald little kids and stuff. So anyway, when you're doing some client ed, that's always helpful. I think for the most part, most of the time, the, the hot setting on the dial is, is usually somewhere right around 120. Um, that is something when we're out in the house, you can actually talk about. We used to, uh, as part of the test, we used to actually take the thermometer over and pretend to measure the temperature of the water coming out. I can't remember if it's still on. Well, if it's still on the checklist, we'll cover it today, but it might have gone away. But anyway, it's a good thing to be checking for your clients, at least educating them a little bit about it. While performing an energy out on a home, you note we are on 39, right? Yeah. You note ice damming on the roof and significant moisture levels in the attic. Your work order for this home should contain what? B. B. Uh, it should be B. Uh, say that again. B. 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 Air sale. The B. B. And did somebody say B? No, it didn't. B. B. All B's. B's. Yeah, B's. The answer, <laughs> the answer is B is in boy. Air sealing to separate the attic from the condition space. And this goes right back to that picture I drew earlier. If, if we have that moist air coming out of a bathroom, if it can get up in the attic, and that, that's what causes the moisture in the attic, and then that heat rise often causes the ice damming on the roof. So if you can stop the air leakage from the attic and make sure you have the, the appropriate amount of insulation, it'll get rid of the ice dam most of the time. So if the outdoor temperature is 35 degrees and the indoor temperature is 68 degrees, what is the heat loss through a 14 foot by 18 foot section of wall comprised of the following building components? Exterior cladding has an R of a 1.5. Cavity insulation is R0. Drywall is 0. 0.44. Did you skip 40? Yeah, we did. I did. Now that I've read all that, let's talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to read everything. So, D. I'm not even sure I did the math right. I did C. I guessed. You did C and guessed. You did. I, I did D and tried to do some math. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if it's right though. Kurt. I did it. Kurt. Okay. And this is again. I would skip this one till the end, and then I would think, wait a second, this heat loss. So where would I go looking? Uh, I would bet that there's going to be a some information about this either on the formulas sheet that, that they will give you or there may be another handout that covers HVAC or heat loss stuff. Uh, do you guys know if you open up a PDF and you hit control F it will let you start to search for a word in that PDF. Most of the attachments if not all of them are PDFs and so you can hit control F. So what would you search for if you were trying to find a way to answer this question? I'd start by searching for heat loss. Heat loss. Yeah. 
yeah. probably be the term I would go after first yeah. Yeah. and see if you can find something in one of those references. You know, I'd, I'd probably be looking for something to do with HVAC and then I'd open that and look for something to do with heat loss. And that way, if there is a good, you know, bit of information there to help you through the test, uh, it'd take you there quickly. Uh, I don't have the formula in front of me. I have the math in front of me. So you want to see what the math looks like, but maybe we can walk backwards and figure out what the formula is. Uh, you guys want to Google what the formula is for heat loss through uh, building materials or something like that? And see if it tells us. General heat loss formula is Q equals U times A times delta T. Q equals U A. Yeah, so it explains this, sorry. So let's see. Or in plain words, the heat loss of an area of size A mm -hmm. is determined by the U value of the material and the difference in temperature between inside and out. Okay, so U A delta T, is that right? Is that the formula? Yeah. Yep. yep. Okay, so the U is the, what's U? U, U value. U value, right? And what's A? Area. Area, and then delta T is just the temperature difference, right? Yeah. So how do we get U value? 1 divided by R. 0.44 divided by 1. Yeah, it's the and inverse way, of the, the R value, value, right? So how are we going to figure out our R value? It tells us. we got to add up the, the value of our whatever R values it gave us, which was we got a, a 1.5, a 0, and a 0.44, right? So it gives us an R value of uh, 1.4. What's the inverse of that? What would our U value be? Is that, it's 1 over 1.4, right? It's 1 over 1.94. Is it 1 point? Isn't that 1.94? Yeah. Yes. Oh, this total is 1.94? Yeah. Yes, you're right. I think that's what I was throwing me off. And then our U value is going to be... One over that is that right? Yeah. And yeah, it is. U is one is point five two. So Q equals point five two. That's our U value times. What's our area? Uh, hundred twelve. How'd you get that? It's fourteen times eight. Yeah, our wall section is just fourteen times eight. So fourteen times eight equals one one two square feet. And and then our delta T. What's the delta T? Uh, thirty-three. How'd you get that? Minus sixty-eight and thirty-five. Equals thirty-three. Is that right? So times our delta T. Thirty-three. So. Does the math work? So if we do 0. 0.52 times 112 times 33, what do we get? 1921. Keep hitting 1905. It's like the year that your great grandfather. I got 1921.9. How am I not getting? 1921, 1922, something in there you should get. Equal it out. Like after. This stuff could be on the Some test. The, the thing to remember first off is go look at your formula sheet and look at I your my, my look calculator at your saving a stuff. previous thing. That's why I keep getting a different. The formula sheet is something that, yeah, it's an available reference for you. So 
you'll you, there'll be a PDF as well, but you'll want to look at your formula sheet and see if it has a formula for heat loss. And then you've got to try to plug in, just do exactly what we just did. Yeah. And and don't don't get freaked out. That's why leave this one till the end and then go back and say, okay, can I figure this one out? And um, you know, if, if there's weird letters and things like that, don't get too stressed out. Just just start filling in what you know and uh, and see if see if it starts to make sense. But that's weird. But yeah, unfortunately you can't look at Google. You won't you won't get that paragraph explanation that came with the formula. But if you know that and it so you gotta may this may be a Q, this may be an H. This this particular thing really stands for heat times one twelve times thirty three. And then the U is the U value. And then area and delta yeah. T. So hopefully so the U values and R values and those things in your formulas you'll be very comfortable with. But did you get it? Or are you still getting 1905? This calculator needs to be calibrated. No kidding. Because I, I haven't checked the math. I just have the math here in front of me. So. I got it. I got 0.52 times yeah, 33 times. For some reason, it kept giving me 1905, but I think it was saving a previous thing I kept inputting, even though I was clearing it. So, I mean, I, I got the right, I selected the right number based on my math. My math was a little off. And. If uh, that question just freaks you out and you know you got other questions that you've got a better chance of answering, then just guess and move on. But I don't know if I'd go with your gut. You might, I don't know whose gut you're going to use to guess. <laughs> I don't use my gut. Do uh, the opposite. There you go. So think, think what you think it is. And I know. Today was a better day. Yesterday was just a... Bad gut day. I'm having a bad gut day today. I think yeah. some of it on this one was just the old questions and new questions. You know? Yeah. All right. So you guys okay on that one? Yeah. Reasonably. All right. Calculator will be here. So. Forty-one or sorry, forty. We missed it, huh? While performing an energy audit on a home, you find dark, dirty areas on the underside of fiberglass bat insulation installed in the attic. This is most likely an indication of what? B. B. B, yeah. It's air leaking from the house into the attic. It's just an air filter. Yeah. So my favorite example of this was we, I was in a house in Provo. And we went down in the basement, and in the basement, in the corner of the basement, they had a fruit room. And the whole basement was finished. And, you know, this wall and this wall were drywalled. And we got looking in the basement, and this is just concrete, unfinished room, but it's a fruit room. And we did a zonal on this room, and it was really high. I think we, like, you know, we, we stuck our hose under the door, and we are getting, like, a 17 or something. And... Thinking, why is this so connected to the outside? And, and the, well, I wasn't thinking. The guy, like the guys that I was with, I was like, "Come tell me, why is this thing so connected to the outside?" And they're looking at it. And they're going, "Well, the foundation, it's solid concrete. That's a pretty good air barrier. Like, what is going on here? Why, why so much air leakage?" And and hopefully, I've expressed this to all of you, but the second leakiest place on a house is the rim. Yeah. And and they didn't quite believe me, and so I just walked over and I pulled the R13 bat out of the rim and I s turned it upside down and, and, and the edge of every single one of them was just black. Yeah. And it's just because so they weren't exactly. all it was just insulation. Yeah, just, like just some sill boxes. Yeah, they were just some bats insulation in, in up in that seal box. So I just pulled the bat down and you can just see right around the edge of every one of them where it's been acting as an air filter for a long period of time. And so it's just a good indication that's air is leaking there. And so I just told them, hey, if you just pull all those bats down, take some one part, seal it up, and then just put the bats back, you'll probably, you know, get a good reduction and get your zone back to where it should be. But anyway. Uh, 42, the gas input rate of a gas-fired appliance can accurately be determined by what? Okay. I put B. Yeah, I put B too, but I don't know. So, A is accurate or not, but it, 
the gas meter is more accurate. Yes. B, the input rating is, is more manufacturer. This a rating, and it could be just the off. rating. Yeah. 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 Yes, that is correct. So, um, if you haven't noticed it, if you ever look at a gas valve on a furnace, I don't know if I can draw a very good gas valve here. This would be a terrible gas valve, but. There are, there's usually, if it's a, uh, like a one, what is it? Some gas valves are just for like the one speed and then other gas valves are like two speed. If you're having a two speed or variable speed motor, they'll have two different settings on the gas valve. But what they are is they end up being these little screws or, or ports with screws inside of them where you can actually adjust your gas pressure. And so it will adjust how much gas is moving through that gas meter when it's on, like this one would be a two speed. So it would be on, when it's on high, it'll let so much through. And when it's on low, it'll let less gas through. And the point here is that's adjustable on every appliance. So you're absolutely right. Like you wouldn't want to look at the, the input rating on the paperwork because this is an adjustable um, setting on a furnace. So the most accurate way to measure how much gas is running through a furnace would actually be to clock the meter. So, uh, 43, if a 30 by 30 attic is insulated with 14 inches of loose built fiberglass, but the six foot by three foot pull down attic access is not insulated and only has an R value of an R44, what's the overall effective, or the overall effect on the attic insulation? What did you guys get? I said C. Yes. You said C. I wasn't really sure on this one. You wasn't sure. I put D. Overall, R value is not effective. Okay. The answer is C. So think about that. You've got a thirty by thirty attic. So if this house is thirty by thirty, which it's not, because it would be a square. But you've insulated the entire attic, and then you have this one little attic access that's six foot by eight foot. The whole attic is insulated, and that is not. The whole attic insulation is an at, is an R value of what? Uh, I think it's 42. Uh, 14 inches of loose fill, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yep. And then... Uh, three inches per? Or three R per inch? On yeah, screen. that's... I, I suspect when you start doing the math on this that you'll wish that you knew exactly what the R value is. But yeah, if you did it three R's per inch at 14 inches, we've got an R value of like 42. Yeah, 42. Right. So you have an R42 on this whole thing. And what's the 0.44 R value coming from? That's just our drywall, right? So we got a piece of drywall here with no insulation. And the question or the answer is that it will, it literally makes the overall, overall R value of this entire attic an R 14. That's crazy. So what's the math on that? Okay. So the math on that, again, you would have a formula that you would want to you'd look for. But I got to look up the formula for this and we can figure it out. So let's see. Effective R value. Test because I have a lot of studying tonight. Yeah, <laughs> a lot. I guessed right on more than I thought I would, but I'm probably gonna have like a sixty percent. I'm probably gonna be down. I'm gonna have to find the formula. It might take me a minute. Maybe yeah. let's save this math on this one for after lunch with our relative humidity too, but, and th this is not like, this is not an extreme case. It's like when you think about the size of the attic and stuff, yeah. if you do the math on a few of these things, you'll find it's, it becomes extremely important that we actually insulate our attic scuttles, which, which begs the question, why in the world we don't have like a, Attic scuttle insulated or uninsulated on the audit. It should just automatically every single time the audit should tell us to insulate the heck out of the thing. But 
Uh, anyway, 44, while performing an energy audit on a home, you determined from ASHRAE 2010 worksheet that the house requires 75 CFM of continuous ventilation. You find that the house currently has 25 CFM of continuous ventilation. What should your work order contain? Yeah, indeed, let's just add 50 more. Right? And, it, and again, the point would be continuous. 45, while performing an energy audit on a home, you find a crawl space with a dirt floor and no foundation wall vents. Zonal testing shows that the crawl is seven Pascal with reference to the condition space or a negative 43 Pascal with reference to the outside. What should you include in your work order for this space? Okay, the answer is gonna be C because which is a better air barrier in this scenario? Is it the floor or is it the foundation walls? The foundation walls. Yeah, the foundation walls are a way better air barrier. And we know that because at seven Pascals with reference to the indoors, the crawl space is very connected to the indoors. So we're gonna bring the crawl space, we're gonna keep it inside the thermal envelope, right? Yeah. And so the work order should air seal the foundation wall and put a vapor barrier. The crawl space ain't written. Zonal testing shows crawl is seven pascals with reference to the condition space at 43. Yeah, the, the negative 43 is, is with reference to the outside. Outside, okay. Yeah, so again, if it helps, draw yourself a picture. But with reference to the inside, that crawl space is at a seven. So if it was completely connected, if these two spaces were completely connected, what would we zero? Yeah, we get a zero. Since it's a seven, we know it's that space is more connected to this space, which means that right here and here is a better air barrier than this floor is. So draw your hole just for your reference to the outside, and then you just put the, like say this a four. You put that as a forty-three. Yeah, but it's it's with reference to the outside. So the the gauge, I like to just draw the gauge is outside. So, cause that's where my reference okay. tap would be. So my reference tap is outside and that would give me a negative 43. But, and all that saying again, if, if I take this hose off and I'm outside, what should it be? Zero. It would say zero, right? As soon as I put the hose on, well, if I'm depressurizing this to negative 50 and this says it's getting depressurized to a negative 43, that's pretty connected to that. Start yeah, I, I, I've drawn a ton of those for myself. <laughs> so, if it helps, I please do that. Forty-six. Yep. Which method would be the best way to determine the annual energy usage of a refrigerator? Hey, hey, hey you are correct. Connected to a watt hour meter. Forty-seven. While performing an energy out on a home, in which natural gas? is used for space heating, cooking, and water heating, how would you determine the base load gas usage? A. Okay. The answer is A. You add the usage for the three summer months and divide by three, multiplying the average by 12. Okay, so Usage of three summer months. If you want to know your base load, and so, okay, so this is, we got a house where it's just, we're looking at just the gas bill, right? And so we have, we got our bills for 12 months. January, February, March. Uh, if this is our gas bill, when would you expect the gas bill to be at its highest? In the yeah. winter months. So it's going to be high here and here. 
I remember this off the end last time. In here, right? We're going to see it highest in the winter time. And when would it be at its lowest? Summer. Summertime, right? We'd probably still have some gas bills going on here, but for sure, June, July, August, we're probably not using any gas to heat the home. The question's asking us, how do we determine our base load gas usage? What's our base load gas usage? It's your baseline usage it's, for the... It's our water heat. Yeah. It's, so how much gas is the water heater using? How much gas is the natural gas stove using? Right. From Because our question says we're using space heating, cooking, and water heat. So we just want to know how much are we using and then whether we're trying to figure out that for a month or for a year or whatever, if, if we can identify the three lowest months, that would tell us on average how much we're using to just for water heating and for cooking. That's why it's called base load. Exactly. The basic yeah. load. Yeah, and that's the minimum if, load, basically. Again, if it, if it, the best way for me, I just basically said anything that's not the heating and cooling of the house is base load. Everything else is base load. So, so really what you want to do, you just want to take June, July, August, and let's say, so let's say in June, it was $15. Let's see, I find a better marker. Let's say June was $15, July was $18, and uh, August is $21. So it's saying all you do is you take those three you add them together, and then you divide them by three to get the average. So what, what is the average of 15, 18, and 21? Uh, it should be, oh, so you add those three together and get 44, and then divide by three. So you should be back down right around 18. So that would be your base load cost per month if you needed it. Per year, you'd multiply by 12. The answer to the question is just A, you're going to add the usage for three summer months, you add that together and divide by three, and then you'd multiply by 12 to get your annual gas usage. Following me on that one? Yeah. Okay. 48. What is the correct way to install basement foundation wall insulation? Yeah, it's the beginning at the top of the foundation wall, extend to the floor. And we could probably have a semantic argument about that, but that's the answer. While performing an energy out on a home, you know a 600 square foot crawl space has no foundation vents installed. Your work order for the crawl space includes a vapor barrier over the dirt floor, air sealing, and insulation of the floor above the crawl space. How much foundation venting should your work order include? So C or C. Yeah, answer C. There's no foundation vents are required. Um, I don't think you'll have to calculate the foundation vents. I, mean, I thought it was divided by 300. That is attic ventilation. The I one to 300. It, I thought it was the same as foundation too. No, I, I do not know what the ratio is, but I would... I don't think that they're exactly the same. So I'd have to look and see. Um, the, yeah, the last time I read it, it was I was just reading specific to attic stuff in the code. So I don't know what the foundation stuff says. 50, a wall assembly located in predominantly heating climate should ideally be constructed in what order? Listed from inside to outside. I put C. A, you put C. C, and you put C. Okay. So, what's this question getting at? It's going to ask us where our vapor barrier is, right? Yeah, so, right. in a predominantly heating climate, where should our vapor barrier be? On the inside or the outside of the wall? Inside. We talked about this yesterday. Let's yeah, see. it should be on the inside in a heating climate. So, that's why, so now looking at the questions, the None of them have the vapor barrier first. They all have interior finish first. Right. Only A has vapor barrier listed as second before the framing and insulation, sheathing, and exterior cladding. 
So A is the correct answer. And that's if you, basically if you're building a house, you're going to, here's the studs. You might fill them with insulation, and then before you put the drywall up, the a lot of the cities require that you put a sheet of plastic on that. So you're not thinking like a Tyvek on, on the outside of the heating. Yeah. Nope. If this if it's predominantly heating, the the vapor barrier is different from the Tyvek. You, yeah. you will still see a lot of house wrap in our in our uh, area going up, but that. Tyvek and all of the other house wraps actually have to have a uh, perm rating on them to let moisture out because we want, if we do get moisture in this wall assembly, we want it to dry. And in our climate, because it's predominantly a heating climate, we want all of our indoor moisture, we want it to stop right there and we want our walls to dry to the outside. And if it was humid, you just flip it right around. And it, again, it's because there's more moisture outside than inside. Okay, let's eat lunch because I'm starving. And then somewhere during the lunch, I'll find us some answers to relative humidity and. What were the answers to the question that you asked? What's that? Oh, it, it was, they were, it was just like, at what point will you reach the dew point? And then there was numbers to guess oh, from and things yeah. like that. So, so yeah, we, we want to spend a little time looking at a psychrometric chart. And then also, we got to do effective R value calculation and I can't find the formula gotcha. so I'll find the formula for that while we're taking a break Do you, did you